Is robust economic growth really good news? Plus, getting really serious about deleting plastic from our lives. Coming up on the Growth Busters podcast. Calling, 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 calling. Call the Growth Busters. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Welcome to the Growth Busters podcast, the podcast about one planet living. Now, we found out on our last episode, episode 16, titled Earth Overshoot Day, that in the U.S., we're busy doing five-planet living. Worldwide, on average, we're living like we have 1.7 planets to meet our needs. But the truth is, we have just this one. So, we have some work to do, but it is joyful work. I'm Dave Gardner, director of the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth, and chief scientist here at the Institute for Advanced Growth Addiction Studies. For cutting-edge information about our culture's unsustainable love affair with growth and what we can do about it, be sure to visit growthbusters.org. Now, my co-host for the past several episodes, Dana Hickey, has flown the coop. She's headed back to school, but we are hoping to still have her on the podcast on a regular basis. We don't know how often and how regular that might be. We'll be finding out. But change is good, so today I'm really glad to be joined by Grace Stark. Welcome, Grace. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, well, as Dave said, uh, my name's Grace. Uh, I am originally from Maryland. I received my bachelor's from Towson University in environmental policy and moved to Colorado, became part of Green Cities Coalition on their steering committee. Yeah, and that's where we met at a board meeting of the Green Cities Coalition. What is it that attracted you to environmental studies and sustainability? Well, with environmental studies, particularly policy, I really liked the idea of being able to affect change at the very core of environmental policy. Basically, you can, you know, work towards positive change, but really where the hangups come in is the policy itself. So if you can have influence over the policy, then I feel like that produces more of a lasting change. And that's what really, really drew me to the major itself. Well, the first thing we usually do in these podcasts, Grace, is we go through some of the listener feedback, especially when we get interesting feedback. And since the last podcast was about being an overshoot and all about Earth Overshoot Day, which happens to be the day we're recording this podcast, Mm -hmm. Grace and I are sitting here on August 1st, Earth Overshoot Day, having a conversation that you're listening to on August 7th or 10th or 15th or something like that. So we might have a few Uh, odds and ends of things to say about Earth Overshoot Day, but certainly our listeners did. So Grace, let me share a few things that we heard back after the last, uh, both the podcast episode and also the cool YouTube video that we did where we did the man and woman on the street interviews. All right, here uh, in the email department, Rob wrote, Hi Dave, I have our staff working up an op-ed for a local paper on World Overshoot Day and forwarded your podcast 16 to the staff for inspiration. Oh, great. So that was pretty cool. That was really good news. And that was people actually listening and then actually taking matters into their own hands and trying to uh, affect change in their own way. Taking initiative, yeah. That's really positive. Great to hear. Victoria emailed and said, Dave, I just love you and your work. This piece made me laugh and cry, and I knew nothing. I don't see any gatherings shown where we can get together and cry, are there? (laughs) Meanwhile, I've taken many measures in my life ways thanks to your influence. Hardly ever buying things in plastics of any kind. Bring back bulk. Reusing plastic bags that I do end up with until they are flimsy and sometimes shredding and so gross that my daughter is afraid I'm going to get cancer from them. Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) But do you think I care at age 69? Power on. Cliff wrote, I just watched your video and found it very useful in promoting Earth Overshoot Day. I'll list it in the August 1st Earth Overshoot Day special edition of Sustainability News and Views and also on Facebook. And Sustainability News and Views, if you haven't ever run across that, is a really outstanding newsletter. Very well done. And we'll include a link in the show notes so that you can uh, check it out and subscribe if you want. But uh, this guy puts together a really impressive newsletter. So I'm glad that we should be featured in that August yeah, 1st that edition. Yeah, uh, that's really going to help with that impact. Mm. Never hurts. Never mm-hmm. hurts. Evan wrote, on August 1st, we will table at the state capitol and the local Sierra Club chapter conservation committee has endorsed observation of Earth Overshoot Day. 
So that's from a writer in California. So that's Oh, my news. gosh. So that's a really, um, that's a far-reaching. We did have one critical email from Bruce, partly critical. Hey, Dave, loved the video, but a couple of comments. Oh. You didn't really have a single opposing view represented. Folks who don't believe in what you're saying. That's actually interesting as well. Um, I was talking with uh, someone at my uh, job, and they were telling me that some of the best ways to expand your um, argument is to talk to people with opposing views. So that might be something down the road to consider to hear the other side. But yeah, and I think we could put together a pretty interesting video about that. Although I will say just this, Bruce, that one, it is a little bit hard to find intelligent <laughs> comments denying overshoot. <laughs> Just a little (laughs) humor there. But also because when you're putting together a YouTube video these days, the pressure is always on for us to make it as short as possible because people just don't have the attention span. So for every comment that we would have included that was an alternative viewpoint, that would be one less comment that we could include that might actually educate the viewers about overshoot. And so we would have struggled with that. Except I will tell you, Grace, we actually, out of all the people we interviewed, there was only one person that gave us any pushback at all. He was, mm-hmm. he seemed to feel that science was a, more a matter of opinion and everybody should decide whether they want to believe it or not. Interesting. Yeah, but for the most part, even though we ran into no one who had heard of Earth Overshoot Day, we ran into no one who really knew what overshoot was. Mm-hmm. Every one of them, except for this one person, once I explained it to them, they were just all over that subject. They agreed. They were concerned and, uh, Generally and were with us. positive yeah. feedback on that and, and in support of it for the most part once they realized what it was and yeah. what it was about. So. Yeah. Uh, Bruce had one other critique. Uh, having the video in front of the medical marijuana store may not have been the wisest choice <laughs> as this could also alienate a number of people. And one of the interviews was in front of a medical <laughs> marijuana store. I don't know if you even noticed it, Grace, I, did I, you? I'll confess, I, I did not notice that, yeah. but I think I might have been um, focusing on the, the interview itself and yeah. less on the location. Yeah. But. So there were just a couple of quick sound bites that were in front of that Very store. shrewd observation. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and of course, I was so busy just accosting people, and, uh, <laughs> trying to charm them into being on mic that I didn't even notice where we were. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see. And one more email from Jeff. Nice video. I'm up in Lakewood, Colorado, which has a sustainability council and a sustainability plan for what it's worth. They seem to put a lot of emphasis on recycling and bike paths, yet we still have trash trucks rolling down the streets five days a week, and recycling is an optional pickup service due to their free market approach to dealing with waste streams. And forget about the reduce reuse part of the trilogy. Lakewood, like most suburbs, is fully committed to conspicuous consumption. I've nonetheless written to the Sustainability Council asking them to consider mentioning Overshoot Day in their next newsletter and included some relevant links, including your citizen interviews. We'll see what happens. That's good to hear. And I I will say that's also a valid point because even in Colorado Springs, I think the biggest question that I get asked at my place of employment, as well as just in general from from friends and things like that is, hey, where can I bring my recyclables? That seems to be a very common question. And this is coming from people who have lived in the city for much longer than I have. So. Yeah, my wife, Ruth, has commented on this time. And again, she's a transplant from California. And she was really shocked when she moved to Colorado to discover that we weren't prolific recyclers. The state of Colorado has a really pretty poor track record on recycling so far. And I imagined it myself to be a bit different when I initially moved here. And this has sort of been a learning process, finding out uh, how that kind of works, actually. So, yeah. Okay, now uh, on our YouTube channel, we got one comment that I thought was worth sharing, Grace. James wrote, of course, the elephant in the room is population. Too many people consuming too many resources and generating too much waste. But there is another problem few want to discuss. We can no longer afford capitalism or the version of it that has been foisted upon us by the global oligarchy. If there is to be any hope for the survival of our species, we need to drastically scale back the human project and replace our economic system. At the very basis of that is environmental economics. There's a a disconnect between environmentalists and, you know, the the business side of things. You notice that. In a lot of ways. Yes, I guess it's fairly obvious, I think, but to really delve into that and you, you start to understand just how complex the situation is. And 
I want to say it's a possibility. It's not something I think anyone should rule out, but I think it would be years in the in the making to to revamp it, especially given the administration we have right now and some of the things they've been working on. Yeah, there's been an ongoing debate about whether capitalism is inherently unsustainable, whether we need to eliminate capitalism and try something else or whether there are some tweaks that can be made to capitalism to make it sustainable. And I don't know if I've really completely made up my mind one way or the other. I'm certainly, you know, don't have a lot of economics Mm -hmm. training, but there are people debating it. There's people, you know, doing research and analysis. And uh, I don't think we're ever going to even come to agreement as to whether it needs to go or not. But while we're debating it, we sure as heck ought to be trying to make it more sustainable, somehow encourage and uh, incentivize the best behavior that capitalism can create and find ways to discourage and disincentivize the worst behavior that capitalism sometimes seems to bring out. As an initial step, I think that sounds like a very positive step forward. Yeah. Now, Grace, I want your opinion on this because okay. we posted the, our little Earth Overshoot Day video called What is Earth Overshoot Day? And if you haven't seen it, we'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes as well so that you don't miss it. But we posted that on Facebook, and I got a note just popped up on Facebook. You know, as page administrator, it told me, your video is popular with women between the ages 55 and 64. What do you make of that? (laughs) Um, Honestly, I'm not sure. I think, I don't know if it's the observation is as a whole, this is who the video is popular with. That's, this is who it's reached. I guess. That's kind of all I can do is presume. Yeah, I think I'd like a little bit more of an explanation as to how he's reaching that conclusion. Well, it was Facebook. It was Facebook. It was some kind of an automated thing. Oh, oh, okay. Based on okay. viewer data. Oh, perhaps that's that's actually something that we did kind of brush on in some of my classes when we talked about women's opinion of what needs to happen to protect the environment. And and there was talk that women tend to take on a more caregiving side and that that might be partially why. And that's not always the case at all. But I'm wondering if that has anything to do with it. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's what came to mind for me too, because I should have looked up the episode number, but in a a long ago, a much earlier episode, we actually talked a little bit about this question, is being green macho? Because people have written about that. And kind of on the surface, there's this feeling that it isn't macho, that men, at least they are less likely to admit that they are trying to live sustainably. Their behavior, hopefully, isn't a lot different than women. But it's easy for women to admit that they're trying to live sustainably, because that's a really nurturing way to live. And I wonder if it has anything to do with the earth being referred to as Mother Earth for a lot of people at a lot of organizations, that it is, it does have a a very feminine characteristic sort of, I think, put on it, it maybe by just society. So again, yeah, I think if, if it may be if that change, that it might be more popular for men to admit that they are very comfortable with their cycling and participating in sustainability initiatives. Yeah. And I joke about it a lot, but I don't think it's funny about how to be a real man in the United States, you have to drive a big gas guzzling pickup truck. That is being macho. And that is certainly the opposite of being green, you know, riding your bicycle or walking or, or driving a hybrid car. Those would be much more sustainable ways of getting around, but they're certainly not macho in this culture, you know, the overall culture that we have today. Yeah. And I I would say that it probably it's, it's, uh, commercialism that might have something to do with that. There's a lot of commercials depicting the man's man driving the big pickup and, you know, wearing the cowboy hat and and doing all that sort of thing. And I think that that probably does have a lot to do with it. Just seeing that, you know, on a day-to-day basis for for men. I think that on the one hand, that's a reflection of our culture, but it also reinforces that. Yeah. Just reinforces that and keeps that culture, keeps us stuck with that culture, unfortunately. I I agree. Yeah. One more reason to just ban advertising. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, one last thing. We're not seeing that much action on Twitter. Hopefully you're following Growth Busters on Twitter, but I do want to thank Laura Carroll for this tweet. She's author of a book called The Baby Matrix, Why Freeing Our Minds from Outmoded Thinking About Parenthood and Reproduction Will Create a Better World. Uh, And she shared our podcast with this comment, another great Growth Busters podcast, Earth Overshoot Day, and had a link to it. So thank you, Laura, for spreading the word. Thank you, yes. 
All right. So moving right along, that was a lot of listener feedback, more than we usually get. That's a good thing. That is a good thing. And so I really want to encourage you, the listener, to keep writing. Uh, Make a comment on the Growth Busters podcast Facebook page or a comment on the the website or send an email to podcast at uh, growthbusters.org or send us a tweet and we'll share your thoughtful comments in the next podcast. And I think it is important to to point out, even if you do have an opposing opinion, I think that would that would be welcome as well to hear both sides. Definitely. So yeah, we always love a good debate. Yes. All right. So next up, before we get to the main topic at hand, just because this is pretty timely, late in July, we heard these words from Donald Trump. I am thrilled to announce that in the second quarter of this year, the United States economy grew at the amazing rate of four point one. U.S. economy grew at the annualized rate of 4.1% in the second quarter, according to the U.S. Commerce Department, and Donald Trump called that amazing. What do you think about that? I think that if you're looking at it from just an economical standpoint, then it sounds great. It sounds like everything that he, he made it sound like. But if you take the stance of the effects that it's going to have, on the environment, um, on sustainability issues, that it's not quite what it sounds. I think that there are consequences for those changes in the economy, and it's it's not really being pointed out because it's it's they're they're not going to be positive. Uh, Darn changes! <laughs> surprise, you're, surprise! <laughs> you're raining on their parade. <laughs> I'm so sorry, <laughs> but it's the truth. <laughs> yeah, you put your finger right on the reason why I wanted to talk about this a little bit, because the celebration of it is just so universal. The headline in the New York Times was, economy hits a high note and Trump takes a bow. And of course, the phrases that I highlighted in this news story were already strong economy, best year of growth in well over a decade. Consumers led the way, shrugging off higher gasoline prices and sluggish wage growth to step up their spending on everything from cars to clothes to restaurant meals. And that's precisely it, isn't it? That yeah. What happens if we step up our spending on everything from cars to clothes to restaurant meals? Those things that we're spending money on as consumers, there's an end product for it all. And that's not taken into consideration. They're looking at the, you know, that initial spending and, and that's kind of, you know, isolated. They're looking exactly at the beginning. They're not looking at what happens, the resources that are going into making those products and the effect that it's having on the environment. That's not the focus. It, it's, well, it's the it's jobs and it's right, profits and, and stocks going up. Exactly. And, and those are the three that's the bottom line, those that focus, but there's there's much more to it than that. It's it, that's essentially the tip of the iceberg. Yep. The bottom line bad news is that economic growth really is not a measure of how healthy our economy is. It really is a measure of how unhealthy our economy is. When you're on an overcrowded planet where the human enterprise has already far outpaced the ability of the planet to meet our needs, as we learned when we were talking about Earth Overshoot Day, then increasing economic throughput, even if it does provide some narrow-minded, short-term improvements like more tax revenue, maybe easier to get a job, maybe higher paying jobs. At the same time, it really is a measure of how fast we are destroying the ecosystems that we depend on to sustain life. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to play for you, Grace, uh, just a brief moment from MSNBC's Morning Joe. I want to share with you their response to Trump's right. uh, braggadocio about the economy. Absolutely. That's very good. He is correct is about 4.1% growth. That's good. We, 4.1. If you can do that now, for a year, brother. Here's the thing. Most economists would not use the word amazing to describe it. Quarterly increases of at least 4% are not unheard of. In fact, President Obama reached that mark four times, including three times higher than Trump's 4.1%. Trump's quarter would tie just the 13th best quarter under Bill Clinton and the 14th best under Reagan. So you're saying that Bill Clinton had 13 better quarters than... Yes, but Trump calls it amazing. Well, it might be amazing. But, oh, but, wait, 13, okay. wait, 13 quarters, is that's like three, that's like three years <laughs> worth of quarters, right? That's a lot of quarters. Yeah, yeah. No, that is a lot of quarters. So, I, but I will say this, Steve. It, it, I remember Bush, uh, W, had... 
well, what, a 5.6 or a 6? It was like amazing when the number came across there. Actually. And the economy seemed to be growing well here. Again, and if he stays at 4.1 the rest of the year, I'm going to say great job, great for Americans, great for everybody involved. Now, see, even this progressive team at Morning Joe, they're busy kind of arguing about whether President Donald Trump really has bragging rights because uh, Democratic presidents had even more economic growth to celebrate during their terms. So they're busy arguing about who had more growth. I mean, they're still stuck on this idea that more growth is better, bigger is better. It's kind of missing the mark because it's it's more of like a spitting contest, I guess. It's more of like, well, this president did better, this president did better, but that's not necessarily what it's about. You're omitting a very important piece of the puzzle. Yeah, it would be so cool if they actually were discussing, wow, for a long time we've been pursuing robust economic growth and Mm -hmm. we've celebrated it. But the truth is, this raises some concerns. And Grace, I think you would be hard-pressed to find a single news story or analysis or commentary out there since that report came out that actually takes this more enlightened alternative view. I didn't find anything. I actually looked at Bloomberg, and the main focus was whether he was going to be able to keep su- it up. sustain, keep it up, that um, that growth. Yeah. And that was the focus, and it wasn't on the other side of sustainability that we're interested in. So. Would have been a great headline, Donald Trump can't keep it up. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, they were talking about a measuring contest, essentially. So Mm. that would have supported it. Yeah, Yeah. that would have been a great piece. You know, we we don't have time in this podcast to really get into (laughs) do a whole course in ecological economics and explain completely why perpetual economic growth is impossible on a finite planet. But when you think about it, what creates economic growth? You know, it was people buying more cars, building more houses, spending more at the mall. Mm -hmm. All of that stuff takes its toll on the planet. It requires extraction of natural resources, generates waste, carbon emissions, and the like. But this, even if you're not completely on board with us on that notion, I think this little mathematical exercise might draw into question this universal celebration for you. What would happen if Donald Trump could keep it up? Let's say he took Viagra every day for the economy, economic Viagra. And let's say for the next several hundred years, we had 4.1% annual economic growth. What would be the result? So I did a little spreadsheet for you. Okay. And what would happen is that at the turn of the century, in the year 2103 to be precise, our economy will be 32 times the size it is today <laughs> if we do that. God. Okay. Well. <laughs> well, and, and you think that's staggering. It's hard to imagine what would happen to the ecosystems if we just had an economy two times the size of today's uh, I mean, economy. We're concerned now, and then you're talking about beyond that. Yeah, but it gets worse. There's more. <laughs> In 170 years, our economy would be a thousand times the size of today's economy. Wow. And just wow. How long do you think it would take before we'd have an economy a million times the size of today's economy? At 4.1% annual economic growth. (laughs) Wild guess. Wild guess. Give me that one more time. Okay. Uh, When will our economy be 1 million times the size of today's economy if we grow 4.1% every year? 1 million. 340 years. 340 years? Yeah. Which is a long time, but... But but not, not in that. the big scale of things. Exactly. It's yeah. it sounds. I think to the to the person alive today. I think your first response is, "Well, I'll be dead. My children will be dead." But it's your great great great. Your great will, will be deceased. Yeah. But that's there will be people beyond that point. And uh, I, I think that that that's what sustainability is about. That we leave enough for future generations. And I think it would be a, a bit selfish of us to just say, "Well, you know, that's not going to involve me because." You will have ancestors that it will involve. And- well, let's do this, Grace. Let's just write a little note to you. It would just be our great, great, maybe our great, great, great grandchildren. And unfortunately, they won't be alive if we do this because Earth won't be able to support life if we were to have that kind of economic growth for just 340 years. But let's say they were. Let's just write a little note to them and say, sorry, the Earth sucks today, but we had great job great time. opportunities and we were making more money this year than last year. I think that it's it's very easy 
at least for the people having these discussions that we just listened to, to have a hard time to look that far forward. But it's, you have to push yourself to look beyond that. You, I think that, that our government officials have a responsibility as almost the stewards of our economy in a way to look beyond that but and I'll guide t- and guide us and guide yeah, but I'll tell you, Grace, the direction that it goes. Economic growth is the single biggest most common public policy goal around the world. It's really just unquestioned, and and I see no signs of any progress. At, well, there, there are little signs. There are some countries and some states and some groups of people that are working on other kinds of indicators, but those just don't get the attention. GDP gets all of the attention. It's so. a very attention-grabbing you know, headline, and it, it also, I think, has the effect of making the particular administration that is active while it occurs, putting them in a positive light. Um, That's how you get reelected. Yeah, and there's a piece missing. There's a, there's a representative missing that can voice, well, which is what we're trying to do now, that can point that out. You know, and, and perhaps they know that already, and that's just intentionally being omitted in favor of that positive headline. But Yeah, so what you need to do, if you want to do something about this, you need to share this podcast with your senators and your congressmen, share it with your vice president and your president, share it with journalists, and you need to send them a copy of my film, Growthbusters, Hooked on Growth. That might help a little bit. Send them a link to... Uh, Cassie. Cassie is one of my favorite organizations, the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. Great website, steadystate.org, full of resources to really get real. It's a reality check about the conflict between economic growth and environmental sustainability. And we just have to redefine what a healthy economy is. And a healthy economy in today's world can't be a growing one. It just has to be an economy that's meeting the needs of the people in that economy. Mm -hmm. And I think to sum up, I think it's, there seems to be this tone of sort of the good old days with this administration. And it seems as if we're approaching the economic problems of the present the same way that, or he's trying to, that we were, you know, they were being approached in the past, but we have sort of, we were born for a different time. I think the earth's not in the same state that it was then. Things are growing, things are changing. And I think you can't approach the problems of today with the solutions of the past. So spoken like a true under 30 year old. <laughs> oh, well, does it show? <laughs> yes, that's a very utopian view. I will disclaimer say that, but it's a very uh, eloquent sort of way of putting it, I think. But it's that's the sense that I get that I think there needs to be other people brought in. As we were saying, to, to consider other options. Yeah, and I did not mean that in a disparaging oh, way no, at all. It's in all a right. hopeful way. You're our only hope. It's because, a, <laughs> you know, my generation... I do we, have hope, which I think is important, yeah, don't, especially during these times. Don't keep doing what my generation did. <laughs> we're counting on you to turn the corner. And, I promise I'll do my best. <laughs> great, great. Okay, moving right along. Let me see a show of hands out there in podcast listener land. How many of you are tired <laughs> of hearing about plastic straws, disposable plastic straws? Well, too bad, because we're going to talk about (laughs) plastic yet one more time. I can't believe that we're still talking about it. But the subject just keeps on getting more and more interesting. And uh, we're going to talk about it today because we discovered a really great post on Medium written by Heidi Bischoff, who blogs and writes and even has a few YouTube videos about skinnying up your life. And she wrote this piece called The Single-Use Plastics You Never Thought About and 13 Simple Swaps. So she basically expanded our conversation. We've been talking about towns that are banning disposable plastic straws and disposable single-use plastic silverware, Mm -hmm. which is good. We need to get those out of our lives voluntarily, if not by decree or edict. But that's just a small, tiny piece of all of the consuming we do. And even if we just confine our thoughts and discussion to plastic. There's an amazing amount of plastic that we don't really need to use in our lives. Wouldn't you say? I would agree. I think that people uh, just sort of get used to the convenience factor. It's also so accessible nearly everywhere you go, both in your home and just out and about. And I think that that is a huge contributor that we can you know, use it so easily. And if that were to change, I think that would be a start to try to curtail some of the use, but it's almost become instinct, I think, for people to do that. And I, I do have an observation about restaurants and plastic straws. Tell us, If do you'd tell. like to hear. Do tell. I know in Colorado Springs, though there are not any 
laws or legislation at the moment that I'm aware of. But I know that individuals at restaurants, servers and whatnot are apparently allowed to not bring straws to tables if they choose not to. If the individuals at the tables, the guests, would like a straw, then they will bring one. I have actually talked to several servers who have told me that, that they've taken that stance on it. So that's it's, it's a positive step. It's a small step, but it's a positive step. Yeah, that's a step in the right direction. And in fact, I was surprised last week to discover that. I had a root beer brought to me at lunch, and there was no straw. And I was really stunned. I was glad because I had forgotten to ask for no straw. That's good. See? Yeah. And but I'm pretty just... sure that that same restaurant, I've gotten a straw automatically for years. And that's the thing. It's not the overall restaurant. The restaurant's still purchasing straws. They have to have them. The Americans with Disabilities Act, I believe, dictates that they have to be available if needed. But I think it's at the same time a comfort to know that individuals can take initiative and do their best to, to try to um, eliminate straws. Now, a lot of the talk about ditching the plastic disposable straws and even some of these other plastics seems to be very focused on uh, our oceans and the health of marine life. It Mm -hmm. seems that that plastic somehow just inevitably ends up in the oceans. Now, I wonder, we're sitting here in the middle of the continent in Colorado. We are far from an ocean, and I don't tend to think that if I were to use disposable plastic silverware or plastic straws or saran wrap or anything like that, that it would ever find its way into the ocean. But maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. Do you know? That's actually a a really good point. And I was going to ask you your opinion, actually, as well, on that, because I had someone I was talking to said to me, well, that exact thing that they were saying, well, I'm not in a coastal state. Uh So I don't think that the straws that we're using here have as much of an effect as the straws that they're using in California or the straws that they're using on the East Coast and anywhere where there's they're close to a coast. And I was going to say, what would you say to them if they if they point blank put you on the spot? Because I honestly, you know, didn't know what to say other than you can't guarantee that those straws are not ending up in the waterways in some sense. I think I'd need to see statistical reports on if they can track the waterways and I guess the currents and things like that to try to gauge where the straws and, and the waste, the plastic waste is coming from. And I think that would probably help support the claim that it needs to be reduced and or eliminated. Well, if anyone out there can illuminate that for us, I would love to hear from you because that would be very interesting. But the truth is, Grace, that whether it's plastic or not, if it's disposable, if it's a single-use item, that means we're using energy to manufacture it, we're using resources to create it, and we're using it once, and then we're discarding it. So even if it doesn't end up up the nose of a sea turtle, uh, (laughs) it's still not the best, uh, most sustainable way to to live your life. Right. I think the point is, is that there are other options. And I think that we kind of owe it to ourselves and, you know, our best future to explore those. I know that there's reusable straws that are made of various materials that you can actually bring with you if you really need to use a straw. I believe there's a restaurant in Bristol in, in the UK that actually uses pasta huh. as an alternative because it will break down, you know, and it's it's the same shape. Boy. It's not, yeah. you know, inordinately sharp, and it seems to be working out for them. So I thought that was an interesting potential or yeah. uh, possibility, rather. Yeah, I wonder how long it takes to get soggy, but it uh, be that's, tasty. Too. I had someone else tell me that we should just use Twizzlers. But I think that as fun as that sounds, I think that that's, uh, people aren't going to rally behind that quite as much. <laughs> well, I've got my reusable straws. And just the other day when we were getting ready to go out, we were going to a concert. And I thought I might end up ordering a soft drink. I like drinking a soft drink through a straw. So I thought I'm going to take my reusable straw with me. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, okay, going to a concert, what do I do with the straw? Do I just have it in my back pocket? And then what do I do with it when I'm finished and it's got soda all over it? I really don't want to put that back in my Mm -hmm. back pocket. So now I need some kind of a great way to carry my disposable straw with me wherever I go. Finally, Grace, I just finally decided, you know what? I don't need to Mm. sip it through a straw. I'll get by. And I did just fine. You took one for the team. No, I, <laughs> just I, ended, up, I ended up drinking wine, so I didn't. Oh well, a then straw. what? No, and you, can, you can't drink wine with a straw. I mean, I guess you could, but it would just look tacky. So, um, <laughs> I don't know if this is. I, I've I've also heard of collapsible, uh, reusable straws. I have not run into and those. And I swear I saw that they were in some sort of container that allowed you to keep them on your keychain. Wow. Yeah. 
That's what I there heard. And that they just fold up and you can put them. That solves your problem of them being sticky with a soft drink or what have you. Cool idea. So cool interesting. Idea. Yeah. So um, back to Heidi Bischoff's uh, piece on Medium. We'll include a link in the show notes. The single-use plastics you never thought about and 13 simple swaps. Some of the things that she mentioned that we use thoughtlessly that we don't really need to use are things like Q-tips. She calls them cotton buds because I believe she's in Australia. They they speak a whole other language down there. Uh, (laughs) Dental dental flossers, disposable shavers, blister packs. Boy, blister packs. That really just, you know what she's talking about? She's talking about ice packs. No, Uh, she's actually talking about medications that are individually wrapped in those little packages. Oh, oh, oh. I know exactly what you're talking about. That you punch through the foil or whatever, the paper, yeah. to get to the medication. And half the time it takes you 10 minutes to get the door right, thing those, open. Right, those aggravating ones, yeah. yes. And, <laughs> and, you know, there's even a firm out there that's now a kind of a, a startup that's offering to blister pack. You tell them all of the things that you take, and they will put them all in blister packs and label them for the day so that you don't have to go to the trouble of getting a pill out of a bottle and remembering whether you took it on Monday already or not. Don't they have those medicine containers that are labeled for the days of the week that are for that, though? Yeah, but those are reusable. <sighs> Atrocities. You can't make a lot of money selling those. It's blasphemy. <laughs> Imagine the money you can sell. <laughs> Individualized. With, with this steady stream of mail-order blister pack medications for people Very who just need it to be that easy. Lucrative. It's just oh, <laughs> breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. Plastic tape. And here's something interesting. She recommended as a substitute for plastic tape, masking tape. Masking tape is basically made out of paper. Absolutely. So it's uh, biodegradable. I didn't know that. That would definitely be an option to explore. No, I didn't know that either, but that's a, (laughs) I'll use that to wrap all my presents now. (laughs) There you go. And one thing she brought up that I actually had been thinking of bringing up on our lightning the load segment, and we're not going to do lightning the load today because this is lightening the load on steroids really Mm -hmm. so but one of the things i do is i really try hard not to use plastic wrap saran wrap is one of the brand names a lot of people use to describe it but when we have leftovers at our house the temptation a lot of people do it without ever thinking about it Mm -hmm. they've got grilled veggies left over in a bowl and they're going to put them in the refrigerator and have them again tomorrow they put some plastic wrap over the top of it and put it in the fridge Mm -hmm. well To me, that is just anathema. I just can't bear that I've got some single-use discardable item involved in that process. So one of the things I do is I just put a plate on top of the bowl. If it's a bowl with no lid, I put a plate on it. It's a lid. And I'm not throwing the bowl or the plate away. No plastic wrap involved. And I do know that they have been making these, I believe it's sheets of fabric that are coated in wax that you can actually wash and reuse and will mold around your container. And they're pretty airproof, I guess. I think right now some of them tend to be a little pricey because it's still a bit of a novelty. But I believe there's also instructional videos online about how you can make your own. (laughs) We'll say that. So So there are alternatives if you just have to have some kind of a wrap. But, you know, here at our house, we're really trying to have more dishes that are more conducive to living more lightly on the planet. So we definitely have plastic containers that are reusable, but we know that if we put leftovers in a plastic container and then we're going to reheat it in a microwave the next day, we have to take it out of the plastic container before Mm -hmm. we microwave it. So we really like glass containers that can go in the refrigerator, can go in the microwave, you can eat out of. And so that's fewer dishes to wash. And Always a plus. as you know, washing dishes, every load of the dishwasher uses energy and water and the water treatment plant has to treat that water. Right. And so there's a little bit of an impact of using more dishes. What about you? What other, do you have any other good habits you want to brag about? I always pay attention to what's recyclable and what's not when I'm purchasing things. So if I feel like I absolutely need to have a set of Tupperware, because if I'm being honest, there is a convenience factor. And again, I think everyone has, you know, a slightly guilty of that, I think, in various capacities. But I'll pay attention to the lifespan and what happens to it at the end. And that's actually a big deal for me that I'll look on the bottom of it and look for that little recycling sign five or six, I think in plastic, ones and twos, fives and sixes, to pay attention to that and say, okay, when I am done with this, what's going to happen to it? Can I recycle it? So if I have to use this, absolutely. I know that I can finish it out at the end of its life cycle and drop it off at the recycling center. So 
Excellent. Outstanding. Absolutely. Okay. One more quiz for you today. Sure. I promise it's the last one. <laughs> what single-use disposable item do you think Growth Buster Dave wants people to use more of? What single-use disposable, disposable item, item do I want people using more of rather than less? Condoms. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> because... You can recycle to the hilt. You can get rid of single-use plastics from your life. But if you have four kids or eight kids, the footprint of adding all those humans to the planet is huge. It will dwarf all of your green living. And so uh, I just want to remind everybody that the greenest decision you can make is to really think carefully about family planning, how big your family is going to be. That's a very good point. Yeah. Couldn't resist working in a good condom. No, that joke. was excellent. I didn't expect that at all. So, <laughs> Very in fact, good. let me show you something. I have, I have show and tell. <laughs> okay. These just came in the mail from the Center for Biological Diversity. Have you heard about their endangered species condom program? No. For some reason, I got a bunch of them that are in Spanish, which is, wow. which is great. <laughs> Extinción es para siempre. So extinction is forever. I believe that says that's what it says. You speak with a great accent, so oh, you must you. have studied Gracias. Spanish. <laughs> so here's an English one. Oh, oh! For the sake of the horned lizard, slow down, love wizard. <laughs> oh, look! I was right. Extinction is forever. There you go. Yep. So, Center for Biological Diversity they design these and they give them away just in order to raise awareness of the fact that. Human population growth pushes species off the planet. Do they actually have like the animals on them? No, no, no they're pretty much basic condoms oh, inside okay. those boxes. Be- <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but anyway, we'll include a link in the show notes to the Center for Biological Diversity's Endangered Species Condom Program, and maybe even a link to one of our good YouTube videos where we actually accosted men and women on the street and gave away these endangered species condoms. Have you seen that video yet? I haven't, but I'm going to watch you it now. Kick, you <laughs> might get a kick out of that. The best thing that we can do is, I think, to continue and try to spread knowledge mm-hmm. overall and to do it in a way that's comprehensive. What's most important is to just reach out to everybody as much as you can and get the knowledge out there. And I think that's a huge start, giving people the knowledge to work with so that they can make educated decisions on their own, sort of laying the groundwork for them. I think it's huge. Well, thanks, Grace. What a great way to wrap up. Thanks so much for joining me on the Growth Busters course, podcast. Of my pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I thought you did a great me. job. I hope you'll come back. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, don't forget to explore issues at growthbusters.org. Subscribe to the podcast on your podcast app. And please give us a review if you like what we're doing, because that'll help other people to discover the podcast. And we'll talk to you again in another week or two. Someday dream to pay mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Someday just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us. We are the growth busters. Calling, 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 calling.